strong and don't forget your cross. Okay? And if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to, uh, turn to them in Matthew's Gospel, the 16th chapter, verses 24 through 27. That's being our text this morning. And in this morning's passage, our Savior once again confronts us with the cost of being his disciples. The Lord reminds us that those who wish to follow him must follow him by the way of the cross. And I suggest that we welcome that reminder. I also suggest that it comes from someone who loves us so much that he would willingly lay down his life for us and who deserves above all else our eternal life with him in glory. This morning, let us allow the Holy Spirit of God to use that reminder to move us to the place in following Jesus that he wants us to be. First, we're going to see the commitment Jesus demands of those who desire to come after him. Look at verse 24 of your text. Then Jesus said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In our passage, Jesus turned to his disciples and spoke, but his words were clearly meant for a larger audience than just these 12 men. I'm going to suggest to you this morning that it is implied to you and I as well. He gives an invitation that is wide open to all humanity, really. Notice he says, if anyone wishes to come after me, now, take careful notice of that important word, if, that we find at the beginning of that wonderful invitation. It highlights the essential condition of coming after him. If anyone wishes to come after me, come after Christ, he is saying, then let that person fulfill three critical requirements that Jesus listened to. He doesn't suggest, he doesn't just toss out there, if you don't have anything else to do, do these three things. He demands of all who would come after him. And let me tell you what they are. first one is, he says, deny themselves. Two, take up their cross. And three, follow me. Under the first heading, I want us to see that the Lord tells us that we must deny ourselves. Jesus isn't simply speaking here of a minor little act of, de of denying ourselves something that we want, okay? He's not saying, well, deny yourself a bowl of ice cream after dinner tonight. Nor is he speaking of the more extreme form of self-denial that we see in many of the religions of the world. Many have denied themselves many things and thought they were being very spiritual in the process, and yet they were actually focusing in on themselves the whole time they were doing it. Jesus, Jesus isn't merely speaking of denying ourselves something. I need you to hear me. He is saying of nothing less than a full denial of our very selves. In the original language, the word that he uses is a very strong word, and it means to deny utterly, to completely renounce and disown self. That's what he's saying there. Our nature, our natural focus, of course, is towards self entirely, isn't it? It's like I've always said to you, it's, it's the big three, me, myself, and I.
But Jesus is using the word, and it's the same word that he used of Peter when he said over Matthew 26, 34, we'll see that before the rapture. When Jesus said to Peter, truly I say to you that this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter, in that instance, in Matthew 26, 34, he said, listen, I don't know this guy. I renounce him. That's how strong of a word that is. And at this very point, Jesus calls us to do something that is completely opposite to everything we are told by culture, isn't it? And not only by culture, by our own fallen nature. Everything in us, around us, is geared toward gratifying and glorifying ourselves. We're told that we cannot love anyone ex else until we love ourselves first. Now, I know some of you will say, well, Pastor, that's biblical. But you've got to learn the whole context of it, okay? Let's not take it out of context, beloved. By our fallen nature and by society, we are encouraged to be our own cause. Again, me, myself, and I. Even the concept of spirituality or Christianity in our day has come to refer to the process of fully realizing by our action the self, us. And yet the Lord calls us to do the very opposite that all society and all our inner feelings are telling us to do. So Jesus tells us as a first step in his call to de dethrone ourselves. We must lay aside our agenda and the pursuit of our rights and our satisfaction and our accomplishment and our ambition as the chief object of our very lives. We are to set it aside. In short, unless we dec decidedly step out of the driver's seat, let's put it that way, of our own lives and allow Jesus to sit there in his proper place, then we cannot even begin to truly follow him. How many of you have seen bumper stickers are on cars that says, Jesus is my co-pilot? I hope and pray not. I don't want him to be my co-pilot. I want him to be my pilot. Because, see, I know enough about military and I know enough about the Air Force that the pilot is the main guy. It's not the co-pilot. The pilot is the one that sets all the courses. And the rest of the crew just follows along. Second, Jesus tells us that we must take up our cross. Now, I have to say this, sadly, many people have misunderstood what Jesus meant by taking up the cross, okay? Many have interpreted this to mean that taking up that particular thing in our lives that burdens us. I've even heard people stand and look at me and say, well, pastor, and that's how they'll say it, you can tell by their tone of voice, that's the cross I must bear. And I just want to go, oh my goodness. Other people, it's a person who is driving them nuts at the time. My, and you fill in the blank, my mother, my grandmother, my aunt, my husband, my wife, my kids, well, they're just the cross I have to bear. Like it's some big burden. Well, the fact is that we wouldn't have any such crosses to bear if the first thing Jesus demanded us was true in us. If we denied ourselves, we'd quit looking at ourselves. 
and that we would utterly and completely deny ourselves. And that pretty much well takes care of everything else that might burden us. If I'm not my main center of a fo- focus and main center of attraction and attention. But that isn't what Jesus is talking about anyway. What Jesus is speaking of is something that everyone who lived in his day and under the rule of the cruel Roman Empire would have probably seen more than once in their life. And that is a condemned criminal being forced as an act of public humiliation to carry the instrument across. Maybe today it would be with a table with the lethal injection. In times past, it would have been the gas chamber or the electric chair. But an act of public humiliation to carry the instrument of his own death up the street into the place of their execution. To take up the cross puts practical action to the idea of denying oneself. It means to embrace in complete readiness at all times and in all situations to consider that we have no more rights than a condemned person. That a condemned person would have on their day and way to execution. It would mean that we we would deny ourselves even to the point of death just as Jesus did for you and for me. It would mean that we would consider, as Paul the Apostle said over in Galatians 6, 14, but may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. It would mean that we would say, as Paul the Apostle said, and was able to say of himself in Galatians 2, 20, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. That's what it means. Thirdly, our Lord says that we must follow him. This means that we must imitate Christ. If I follow somebody, I am imitating that person. If they lead off with their left foot, guess what? I lead off with my left foot. If they lead off with their right foot, I lead off with my right foot. It means that we must go where Jesus would go. It means that we would act as he would act. It means that we would walk as he walked. It means that we must obey his commands and keep faithful to his instructions. You have all of his instructions right here. It means that we must set him apart as not just Savior, There's too many people that have Jesus as Savior. They don't have him as the other part. Okay? But it means that we set him apart in our lives as Savior, yes, and praise God for that. But we also set him apart as our Lord. Now, if he is our Lord, then guess what that makes you? Guess what that makes me? His slave. And in biblical times, a slave had no rights whatsoever. You just did what the man in charge said. That's all you did. If he said come, you came. If he said go, you went. If he said stand over here, you stood over there. If he said stand over here, sit over here, you stood or sat over there. And if we say that Jesus Christ is our Savior and Lord, then that is what we must do whatever he tells us. So you see from just the first part of the commitment, the requirements, Jesus doesn't demand much, does he? No, he demands it all. And if you're his follower, then that is what you need to give him. Your all, my all. 
The level of commitment he demands is total. Now, our Lord goes on to explain the implication of what he has just said. And this leads us to the second requirement. The second requirement is that this level of commitment places on you and I. Look at our text again, Matthew 16, look at verse 25. Whoever wishes to come after, or whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it gain, or what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeit his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the, in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Number one, I see that the level of commitment Jesus speaks and acts, ask of us requires that we relinquish our hold on our lives. Okay? That's in verse 25. Now, I remember when I was in junior high, and that was many, many years ago, but I can still remember my science class, and I can even remember my science teacher. And he told us how an animal catcher, someone who catches wild animals and brings them to the zoo, how he does it and how he does it with monkeys. Now, he didn't say this, but I'm going to say it to you. I must confess, I don't know if this is true or not, but this is the way the science teacher told us, okay? So I'm just going by what Mr. Hopper said. He said, the animal catcher, as we'll call him, would put a peanut inside of a jar and leave it out in the open. And then the animal catcher would hide in the bushes and wait. And he said eventually a monkey would sneak up, reach its paw into the bottle, and grab the peanut. Now, if his hands was open, he could have pulled it back. But once he grabs that peanut... He can't pull it out of the bottle. It's one of those kind of neck bottles. Now, the monkey's got his hand in the jar. He's got his fist around the peanut. And he won't let go. And the animal catcher would come up out of the bush and get the monkey because once it had it in its greedy little paw around that peanut, it would make a fist and it was too big to pass through the neck of the heavy bottle and the animal catcher would easily get the monkey bottle and all and haul it to the cage now I don't know if that's true or not okay but the monkey couldn't get away because no matter what it was too greedy to let go of the peanut now you're probably going what are you getting at pastor are you calling us all a bunch of monkeys no Jesus is telling us that this life is nothing and it's not something that we can say by holding on to it. That's what he's telling us, right? And if we want to come after him, then we cannot cling to life during this short stay on this earth. I know people that put more emphasis, more of their energy, more of their whole life into things on this earth that is eventually, and this is biblical, God will burn it, but that's what they're putting their stocks in than in spiritual matters. They think as, uh, as things that it's the only thing that is really real and that's really important and that if they have this, it will bring them true happiness and fulfillment would be found. But if we refuse to let go of our hold on this short temporal life and say no to the Lord's call to deny ourselves, 
and take up our cross and follow him. If we don't do that, beloved, then we have made a foolish decision. That old hymn, that old spiritual goes, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. What I have is not mine. What you have is not yours. It was given to you, it was given to me by the Lord himself. And if he wants it back, then beloved, so be it. He has the right. Because, see, he's the Lord. He's the master. We're the slave. Amen? The life that we think we will have saved will prove to be only a momentary vapor. And in the process, we will have lost everything. The real vital principle of life that we were meant by our Creator to experience in an eternal relationship with Him will be gone. But by contrast, if we let go of this temporal life for Christ's sake, if we lose it for His sake, then our life will be kept in His safe keeping and will eventually be ours for all eternity. And I believe and I preach and I teach that our salvation is for all eternity. Amen? You can't lose your salvation, beloved. And don't let some, well, bless their little pointed head person on the radio or television tell you that you can, okay? Look at 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. John the beloved, John the writer of the gospel of John, John the writer of 2nd and 3rd John, John the beloved, John the writer of the book of the Revelation. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in 1 John chapter 5, beginning of verse 11, he says this, and the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life. Who gave you eternal life? It wasn't you. It wasn't me. It wasn't your mama. It wasn't your daddy. God gave you eternal life. And this life is in his son. Who's his son? That's Jesus Christ. Jesus the anointed. Jesus the Messiah. He who had... Now, this is pretty clear that even an old Missouri boy can understand this. He who has the son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. It's not talking about life as we know it, getting up in the morning and working and going to bed at night and eating three meals a day and all that stuff. It, this is talking about spiritual life, eternal life. And then John adds this in verse 13. He said, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, listen to this, so that you may no, not guess, not hope, that you may know you have eternal life. Number two, the level of commitment that Jesus asks of us requires that we value our souls above this world. Look at verse 26. Go back to our text. In Matthew 16. Verse 26, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus here speaks of an immeasurable value on the soul. The people of this world value someone in terms of what he or she has or is externally. It's usually in terms of income and possession and reputation and looks. 
the attitude of the world is that the more someone has, the more someone is, is the person that has it all. And they're the ones that you should follow. Yet Jesus says that one's life does not consist in abundance of the things he possesses. Our Lord told a parable over in Luke chapter 12, verses 16 to 21. In that parable, the rich man in Jesus' parable sought to protect and preserve life only during this short time on earth. Advancing his earthly life was his only agenda. I will do this, and I will do that. He sought to save what it turned out he could never keep. He built his empire on that which was scheduled for demolition, and in the process he lost that which was of the greatest value, his own soul. And what then will a man give in exchange for his own soul? I find it tragic to lose our souls in the pursuit of what, of that which will not last. And it's horrible to stand in front of the judgment and see that you gain a perishing world and lost everything of eternal value in the process. How much better to lose the whole world and follow Jesus instead. Amen. Number three, the level of commitment Jesus asks of us requires that we invest ourselves totally in his return. Look at verse 27. For the Son of Man, who's that? Jesus. Amen. Who's the Son of Man? Yeah, the Lord Jesus is going to come, uh-oh, he is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and then repay every man according to his deeds. The Apostle Paul lived his life on earth in a confident expectation of the day of Jesus' return. We don't know when it could happen. It could be could happen before I give the final amen on this message. It could come right now. But it will come. It may not come 20 years from now. We don't know. But I do know this, my friend, beloved. I bank on it. Because Jesus said, right there in verse 27, I will come. And he is a promise keeper. And when he promises something, he fulfills it. And Paul felt that way too. Paul was even willing to lay down his life for Christ because of, this, this, of his hope in that day of Jesus' coming. Now, just before Paul the apostle was e executed, and he was executed for his Savior. Paul wrote over in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, th six through eight these words. He says, listen, listen to him. He says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time has come of my departure, or my departure time has come. He's talking about leaving this earth. It's come. He said, it's here. It's at the door. It's knocking. But then he says this, he says, I have fought the good fight. I've finished the course, I've kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will reward me on that day. But then he adds this, he says, and not only me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. I'm going to ask you a serious, serious question this morning. 
The most serious one is, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? But I guess the second serious question is this. Are you waiting for his appearance? I hope you are. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I cannot wait. Okay? If it happened in the next second, that wouldn't be fast enough. I want him to come now. Because here's why. I'm going to be with Jesus for all eternity. And what's more with Paul the Apostle, he not only felt that way, but he encouraged his fellow believers to also put their hope in that day. And he writes it over in Colossians. Let's look over at Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. You there? Colossians chapter 3. Look at verse 1. Paul writes to this church there in Colossae, and he says, Therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Then he says this. He says, set your mind. Now, that word mind means set your thinking. Okay? Set your thinking on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. What amazing statement. That is what Paul the Apostle was encouraging his fellow believers to do. Now, I'll close by sharing this with you. If you truly have your hope in the day of Christ's return, in your resurrection, unto glory, in His presence, then you will be willing to invest yourselves fully in following Him right here in the now. No matter what it costs. No matter what it costs. You will count it your greatest joy to stand before Him on that great day and hear Him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Jesus is telling us that because that day is certain, following Jesus with total commitment is the wisest investment anyone could ever make. I hear all these people talking about their investments in this stock and that stock, and, and they've got their portfolios and this, and they've got that and this. You know, and that's all well and good, and that's, there. I mean, if that's what you want to do, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with, you know, preparing yourself for retirement. But don't make it your all in in all. Make your total investment in the person of Jesus Christ. It cost is everything to follow Jesus but I must add that it's a price that we can safely pay through the power of Jesus Christ. He demands everything from us, but he never takes from us without also promising to give us way more than he takes in return. He makes a promise to us, a promise that he intends for us to genuinely believe in and trust him fully to keep. That everyone who has left house, 
our brothers, our sisters, our fathers, our mothers, our children, our farms, for my name's sake, will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. I encourage you. Let's respond to the Lord's invitation this morning in Matthew 16 by asking the Spirit of God to reveal to us what be, might be standing in the way of our fully following Him. And let's allow the Holy Spirit of God to remove these things from us that keeps us from wholehearted devotion to Jesus Christ. And let's follow him as he taught us in his words this morning to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you And these things of denying self, taking up our cross, and following you, they're requirements. They're requirements of us in order to follow you. So I pray this morning, Father God, for myself and for everyone that's hearing this message. If we say that, well, I'm a Christian then let's live it. Let's live it by first denying ourselves, taking up our cross, renouncing who we are and that we are absolutely nothing without Him. And we have no claim to anything that He is our Lord. We are the, His slaves. And we will do as he tells us to do and nothing else and follow him. Father, speak to our hearts and lead us and guide us. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, let's stand together and I encourage you to get a hand. 305, I have decided to follow Jesus. As I've told you before, so many times we, we hear this song and we think of the lost person out there. I think there's a lot of times that we, people who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, we're not truly following Him. And if we're not, let today, as we sing this song, I have decided to follow Jesus, let that be our prayer. And let it be a prayer that we truly mean and that we will truly follow him by doing the three requirements that Jesus taught us here in Matthew 16. Let's sing. Or Jesus, whatever we 
set our gaze on, that's what we're going to have the most faith in. And that's what we're going to trust in. If I gaze at nothing but my problems, that's all I'm going to see. And I'm going to think that things are hopeless and helpless. And, and then I'm going to become depressed and downhearted. And, and I'm going to be an old worry wart. But if I gaze at Jesus, I, I, yeah, I'm concerned, but I'm not worried. Because see, when I'm worried, I'm saying Jesus isn't in control. My situation is. And we know that's not true. So we need to gaze at Jesus and just glimpse at the situations. Because, beloved, listen, we serve an awesome God. Let's sing. And if God is speaking to your heart, you obey him promptly and you do as he has said. Five, I've decided to follow Jesus. Beautiful song. Beautiful song. If God is speaking to your heart and you feel like you just need to close that hymnal and pray to him right where you're at, do it. Just obey the Spirit of God and obey him promptly. Don't put it off. You listen as God speaks as we sing. Once you gossip, once you slander, once you say something about somebody, you cannot bring them back. You cannot. They're there, and they hurt. If a person is guilty of trash talking, I can't help but thinking of our text and, and wonder how they feel when Jesus said that on the day of atonement you will have to give an account of every careless word you've ever spoken. Does that sound a little scary? Does it make the hairs go up on the back of your neck? I hope so. Because, beloved, when I wrote that and I saw that with my own eyes, I said, Lord, forgive me for some of the stupid things that I've said. The uncaring things that I've said. And I think as humans we can all say that. Scientists who study sound waves. Now, this is only a theory, okay? 
But scientists who study sound waves have theorized that sound waves never really vanish. They just diminish until they are no longer audible to the human ear. Okay? So it's like they're still out there. And some people think that one day mankind will invent a machine so sensitive to those sound waves that are out there that we will be able to go back in history and capture the words spoken 100, 200 years ago. Okay? Now, if that was to happen, I think that would be exciting because I would love to be able to sit and hear President Abraham Lincoln give his famous Gettysburg Address. That would be neat. But see, to me, that's all scientific stuff and scientific journalism. But for God recapturing every word that I've ever said, that's not hard for me to believe because he's almighty God. He's sovereign God. And I'm going to have to give an account for that. He's going to look at me one day and say, why did you say those things? And here's the other thing, beloved. Now, that's not going to keep me out of heaven. That decision's already been made, okay? Let's not think that way. But he's going to ask you the same thing. Why did you say that? Or maybe he will say to us, why didn't you say something to somebody? So as an application for our text this morning and our message this morning, as believers, why don't we commit ourselves today that our words that we say will be sweet and pleasant to the hearer. That they will edify and not tear down. And let us commit today and from this day forth that, that what we say will bring honor and glory to our God forever. Because beloved people out there that do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You've heard me say this before. They're not only watching you, but they're listening to you. And they're watching and listening to you, not just me, to you. And they're determining whether to accept or reject Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now that's an awesome responsibility on us, isn't it? But it's a truthful one. So how about today we commit ourselves to be careful of what we say and let our words be sweet to the hearer. Before we say our word of prayer, let me leave you with this. How are your words? How are your words? Are they sweet to the hearer? Or do they stink? Let's pray. Our Father God in heaven, how thankful we are for your text. And Father God, in how much we ask that you forgive us of our words that we utter in front of other people. and how they're listening to us, Father God. And when we gossip, when we slander, when we complain, when we boast, when we have the filthy language, Father, because we name the name of Christ, we're literally driving and dragging you through the muck and the mire. Father God, I pray for us today. I pray for myself. I pray for all of us that, Father, from this day forth, we will commit our lives that our words will be as sweet as honey 
and they will not be bitter and stink. Father God, help us, I pray, to walk in a way that's worthy of you, to be led by your Holy Spirit. Father God, I pray that you just speak to our hearts and draw us closer to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, let's take our hymnals and let's turn to page 275, I Surrender All. You know, that can even be our speech, can it? Lord, I surrender my talking and my speech to you. And the words that come out of my mouth, Lord God, let them bring you honor and glory and not shame and disrespect. As we sing this song, if God is dealing with your heart, and if he's speaking to your heart, speak back to him, beloved. But let us commit to walk with him in a way that's worthy of him and that our words will be sweet to the hearer. Let's sing.